minutes from the last meeting were circulated. Kelly moves as circulated. All in favor? That is passed. We do have a few guests who are here for our development permit. But so we'll go around with some introductions, and Lionel will get you to start. Good morning, Lionel Just. I'm uh, I'm from Division Ten, which is uh, north and east of Brooks. Good morning, Anne Marie Philipson. I'm from the Patricia area. Good morning, Hubie Callum, Division Two, Tilly. Thanks for the call the other day too. Brian DeJong, and I represent the area around the village of Duchess. Good morning, I'm Kelly Chrisman. I'm from the west side of the county, uh, around the Bazano area. Aaron Samuelung, Rolling Hills. Molly Douglas from the northern part of the county. Good morning, Kevin Stevenson, uh, County Administrator, and welcome. Good morning, I'm Tracy Fife, Division 5, which is south and west around Brooks. Good morning, Wayne Hammergan, Division 4, as we are introduced. Good morning, Ellen Unra, and I represent the countryside around the village of Rosemary. Pam Elliott, I'm Admin Assistant for Planning and Development. Hi there, we've chatted before, Lane Johnson, Director of Corporate Services. Thanks everyone and, and welcome. Are there any post agenda items? Seeing none, can we have an adoption of the agenda? Anne Marie, so moves. All in favor? Good, thank you, that's passed. There are a number of um, development permits in the permitted use report. Are there any questions? Anne Marie? The Brooks Ashfold uh, commercial operation, is that just their regular business or is it something new? It's a new business. It's a hydrovac um, soil drying operation. Anything else? And we'll accept it as information. And development permits, the one we have today, Shauna Lee. Development permit 2019052, 53 and 54 are approval for the existing shed, garage, and deck southwest of Tilly. The applicant obtained development permit in 1983 for the dwelling. However, the deck wasn't included on the permit. There was not a development permit obtained for the shed and the garage as they were constructed prior to 1977, according to the assessment records, which was before there was a land use bylaw. The applicant is requesting a variance for all three buildings, 70 foot for the garage, 26 feet for the deck, and 76 feet for the shed. There was no um, concerns from staff, adjacent landowners, or ORSC. We're recommending approval with conditions, and the landowners are here to answer questions. Are there any questions? Pretty straightforward. Could we have a motion? Yubi moves to grant the three variances. Any further discussion? All in favor? That is passed. Pretty simple. We didn't even have to beg us or anything. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming, and you're welcome to stay as long as you like. There being no post agenda items, nothing in camera, question period. No questions, then I'll adjourn the meeting. <laughs>
We'll get started our council meeting in one minute. Um, I think so, yes. And you? Um, oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a big funeral week. All right, we'll get started. No one needs to be excused from the meeting, and so we'll go to item 3-1, the adoption of the minutes of the council meeting from July 25th. Tracy moves. Any concerns, all in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. The pre-budget planning meeting minutes, August 1st. Clarence will move. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Post agenda items. I just have a report on a conference call of the Southeast Southwest um, Mayors and Reeves from last week. Anything else? All right, can we get a motion to adopt the agenda? Ellen moves. Thanks, Ellen. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Question period? Notice of motion. Let's see anyone here for that. We'll move on. Just take a look at our agenda. We have public hearings at 11.30. We have Cole Steinley at 10.45. So we'll... Move on to Todd, item 9-1. Good morning. How's the summer? <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. Yeah. That's the shock. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. I wasn't talking into the mic. Yeah, it was a little bit of a shock this morning when I got out there and I'm like, I can barely see what I'm doing. This is ridiculous. I should have been in bed, I guess. <laughs> so I'm just here to give you a little bit of an update on how kind of our summer sort of went and kind of where we're sitting with some of our programming. Uh, I think uh, we're all but done roadside spraying in the south. Kim went back and touched up a few areas uh, that we had kind of moved around just the way wind was working that day or whatever. So we kind of went back and touched some things up. Um, they are doing some construction in Wayne's area, kind of rainier-ish, uh, some, some drainage. So there was some ugly roads there that were going back to touch up just the way it works. Um, the roadside mowing, or you maybe heard me mention to Wayne, we're kind of in that Scandia region now. Um, and I think we have two mowers for sure, and maybe one more move in that direction. So we'll be in and out of Scandia Rainier probably by Monday, coming home for a little bit of a service, and then we'll uh, maybe go back and touch up uh, some roads in the north uh, part of the county, so kind of north of number one. And then we're not anticipating a whole bunch of regrowth in the south half, so we should be done uh, relatively early this year. Uh, our club route survey is done. I got Catherine's on the end of a spray gun right now, so I never got to hear how many fields we did. Um, just the, last year we did about 371 on the first run, so I, I suspect it'll be close to that. We did uh, identify two club route fields. Um, 
so far anyways. Um, so that's disappointing, but it could be, I guess, a lot worse. Um, we're currently kind of working with the renters and the landowners to, to make some plans. So all I think is going well um, so far on that route. We did our bacterial ring rot survey. We had six potato fields to look at, uh, primarily in the Rolling Hills, Scandia area. So that's a, it's an interesting survey. If anybody's walked through a potato field uh, in the beginning of, or sorry, end of July, early August, you literally hate your life after the first hour. It's just unbelievable because you have to walk in a, a weird W pattern and you're going through uh, the, the dips and the valleys and the hills and it's it's a horrible experience um, so but anyways uh, the, the crew is happy to do it to look for bacterial ring rot uh, and uh, we had Cassidy Lester do our grasshopper survey uh, she finished up in about three long days she wanted to take this week off so she had no choice um, but she got it done and uh, no real grasshopper problems throughout our county. Uh, we did hear that Vulcan County had some areas that had quite a few grasshoppers, but we didn't experience that. I think our noxious weed programming is going really well. Uh, we have an unbelievable crew that can find things um, that I didn't even know were there, which is fantastic. We also have some wonderful community members and other staff members that uh, to help us out. So we were able to find some tansy, some uh, a new site of common mullion at the Rolling Hills Reservoir from a diligent camper. Um, we've had some a big, uh, a nasty patch of knapweed in the village of Duchess that we didn't really expect um, that our staff found. And then some baby's breath just keeps seeming to pop up in random locations. Uh, but all great landowners to work with and communities to work with. And we, I think we've had a good control season. Um, in fact, we had, uh, a really good control season but it took some longer hours and uh, as seasonal staff works they they accumulate these uh, banked overtime hours so our August is actually it's worked out well that it's dry and slowed up a little bit they've actually been taking some of that time off so that's good for them and for us uh, we did a little bit of brush control work uh, Clarence might have noticed at the Rolling Hills golf course actually y'all might have noticed at the Rolling Hills golf course because I understand we went down there for the golf tournament, uh, but right along the Volker Road, the uh, 875, there was a bunch of old killed trees that we'd killed a few years ago. We finally went back and just cleaned them up because uh, it's kind of a nasty deep ditch uh, and, and some other areas similar to those. I think Hamlet maintenance is uh, slowing down considerably, mowing lots of weeds uh, like alfalfa and, and clovers that um, grow back faster than the grass, but not so much grass. So anything that's unirrigated, as you can well imagine, is pretty slow growing uh, this time of year. So what we usually do in July is just increase our cutting length to kind of uh, extend um, the green of the grass because we don't get a lot of green grass in some of our non-irrigated hamlets. Um, so it's kind of nice to, to keep that green as long as we can. We do lose some of our seasonal help here right away. I guess uh, university starts a little bit earlier than it normally does. So I think next Friday we lose about three and then the Friday after we lose another three or four. So that kind of comes back to the, it's almost like winter showing up and I don't know, like to talk about that word, but that's, uh, that's what the downward trend is. So we are doing, like I said, some cleaning up of some uh, spraying on request. I think uh, Kelly had mentioned some of our shoulder pole roads from last year are kind of getting uh, ugly again which was a surprise to us to hear. Um, we had inspected them after we sprayed them the first time and they looked okay, then we mowed them, so just some regrowth. So they must have had more rain in Bizano than we had anticipated. And we're gonna move into some fencing projects. Uh, obviously you remember that in the budget we put in for some fencing projects, uh, but we're gonna do that work ourselves uh, to save money because of that meeting we had last week. Um, and obviously it's dry, so we have a little extra time this this time of year. And then we'll start uh, prepping for roadside seating because uh, Terry and his crew decided that Tilly needed a lot of shoulder pulls. Um, so we'll do those and maybe some reseeding in some other areas. But other than that, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Todd. Questions? Anne-Marie. Not a question, a comment. There was an article in the Western Producer last week, I think, about using sniffer dogs to find club root. Just wondered if you read that or I can scan it and send it to you. It was interesting that these dogs could be trained 
to find mussels on boats, and now they're working on training them to find clubroot. And especially for the reason that you said, it's so hard to walk through a field. It's impossible. So even for dogs, it might be tough. But I'll, I'll scan it, and I'll send it to you. That'd be great. I, uh, I know that dogs have much better sniffer than I do, but uh, that's an interesting one for sure. That's good. I appreciate that. Uh, two questions. One in regards to the club route. What is the, what are the results in the other municipalities? In in uh, just as a as a, do you see a trend? I guess, or do you, you know? Is there reporting uh, as as it comes in? Are you seeing in uh, sort of a similar thing as what you've experienced? And uh, the second question: When you're doing your uh, gross roadside grass reseeding on a year like this. Uh, when it's excessively dry, is there a way you can manage that for better results, or you are sort of stuck with the with the girl you brought to the party? Well, I'll, you kind of got me stumped there on that last one. <laughs> Uh, the clever one is interesting. Uh, we don't hear a lot of results until everything's kind of tabulated. Um, different municipalities uh, do their survey um, kind of at their own at their own pace in their own regard. Um, many municipalities do it after swathing. We don't have the resources to hit 371 fields after swathing. Um, and one of the things that we had made the decision on a long time ago was to look at every canola field. Um, Many municipalities look at a cross section of canola fields. So they'll look at each township, we're going to do five canola fields or whatever that number ends up being. We, we look at all of them during flowering so that we can see the stuff that looks early matured. We can see the areas of the field that look a little sicker than the rest, the anomalies. So that's what our survey protocol is. Um, when we to go out after swathing, then you do a, a wonderful W pattern. We do a visual from the road. Um, in the back of the truck with binoculars at the entrances, those kinds of things. So our survey might be a little bit earlier than uh, some others and maybe a little more involved because we do try to hit every canola field we can find. Um, so I don't know that yet, but what we do know is uh, the one canola field that was uh, found, well, it wasn't even found by our surveyors. It was actually brought in by the, the renter uh, called us, which was fantastic. Um, that's the way it should be, but it was club resistant variety of canola that was being grown and uh, an amazing amount of galls on the, on the canola. So we're actually working with uh, CDC to do some pathotype testing to see why that resistance was broke down in that field. Um, so it's interesting, the, the fields that we have found, they've never, or sorry, the fields that we have club root in so far, um, none of them are owned None of the landowners were actually farming that property. So it's always been a renter um, on those locations. So it's just, it's an interesting trend for us, uh, or th sorry, an interesting uh, tidbit, I guess, not really a trend, but just maybe it means that there's more renters on that property. Maybe it means that it's an outside uh, property owner that, that owns that land. It's just, maybe it's something's just, it's just something that we've noticed. It's always been a renter on that property. Um, as far as reseeding, it's kind of the same old story. We go in in October as best we can once that ground is cooled off so nothing's going to germinate, although we don't expect it to germinate this year anyways, um, to just to get that spring moisture. So that's, that's the only moisture some of our roads get. Um, that's kind of the one we go after. So always the same. So in areas that have had club root for quite some time, what is happening there with their um, protocols and, and treatments? And, and because it hasn't, it hasn't stopped growing, they haven't stopped growing canola in those areas. Uh, they must be doing something to control it somehow and, or manage it at least. So the only uh, thing that I know that we can manage club root um, populations, or sorry, club root uh, damage on canola is rotation and resistant varieties. So in areas that have a lot of club root, they, uh, I'm not sure how um, 
I'm not exactly sure how they do it, um, but in areas that I know Leduc County has changed its policy because many of their producers are facing the same club root battles. Um, so they've actually changed their uh, policy so that they, they give a pest notice based on incidence level in the field or percentage of affected crop. So if you pull, when you do your survey and you pull your, let's say it's 100 plants, if it's, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say it's 10% of your field is, or 10% of your population is affected, then these certain restrictions apply. If uh, 30 to 50% is infected, then these restrictions apply. So it's just a, a little more management on the, uh, the restriction side. Um, but as a, as a farmer, I think um, the, the loss in yield tends to regulate the growth of canola. The only problem is um, with the resistance that we have currently, it's not res the, the canola is not resistant to every club root pathotype. So when we, and, and club roots, uh, in terms of a, a disease, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's number one. It changes very, very fast. So they're saying two canola crops of the same resistance on a club root infected field, you're gonna mutate your pathogen. So, um, we don't have the resistance for all of the strains yet, unfortunately. So I think that uh, that is a bad thing, and, it, and that I think that helps to restrict um, growers from growing too often. But rotation, rotation, rotation. Other questions? Well, thank you, Todd. Pre appreciate your being here today. Always good to see you. Uh, yeah, well, that's good too. Have a good day. All right, we will um, carry on in our agenda planning and development report, item 10 1. If there's questions, we can get them answered later, but uh, if not, we'll deal with that one. Any questions or otherwise we'll make a motion. Brian moves the acceptance. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And dates. Oh, we'll, we'll skip that unless Matt's real handy. We can go to checks for payment. I'm assuming we need Matt here to set the dates, so no, he's here all the time. We don't have to worry if we choose a date without him. Let's give it a go and see what happens. Okay, well, we, we'll go back to 10, uh, 10, 2. Look at our day timers. Said that some, sometime during the week ending November 1st. So that's the end of October, right? So should we be looking at the week? I think part of the reason that um, everybody's waiting till that time of year or that time of the fall because federal election is the 21st and the prediction of the provincial legislature sitting again is the 22nd. And so hopefully the idea is that they would bring in a budget as well because their budget will have impact on our budget. So the October 28th, will that work? October 28th? And we met 8.30, is that good for people? Do we need to pick a different date lane or just the one is good?
should be. Okay, perfect. So we've everybody's got that in their day timers. So we'll go on to item 10.3, checks for payment. Any questions in the payment register? Tracy will move to acceptance of the payment register. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Request for functions of council and the one that Ariana has listed would be the AUMA convention September 25th to 27th. So who hasn't gone to that recently or ever? Or is there people who are interested in attending that who haven't been already? Clarence is interested. Um, and Kelly? All right. Kelly hasn't been either. We must be getting close to everybody having had a rotation. Have all you guys over there? Yeah? Lionel, have you been? No? Uh, Hubie and Amory, everybody else on this side? Okay. Well, that's perfect. Do we need an alternate as well? I mean, not just in case. Kelly's nodding like you might. That's what made me think of it. I, I'm assuming if one goes, he can report back or she, right? It's, it's not like it's so different from the RMA. It's not really special. So if uh, something happens, then we'll just do one. Okay. All right, so we'll make a motion for that, Brian. Yeah, I'll make a motion that uh, Kelly and uh, Clarence attend on, as a function of council. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, Mark's report is in there. Um, item 12.1, we'll skip to the RMA has called for another meeting on August 21st in Three Hills, I believe that meeting is. And I am able to attend, and Kevin, I guess we'll leave it up to you or Matt, however you're going to go. Okay. So Kevin is able to go also. So Ariana, if you could get those names to them, that would be awesome. What time is it? Oh, 10 to 1, I think. And it's of the, uh, uh, I'm calling them the big 15, but could be the getting poorer 15. <laughs> um, this is a meeting that the RMA promised to have at a later date when more information was available from the government because we still don't have a lot of information on what it means, and Kevin is thinking it's because Cyprus and Newell are pretty complicated to have a look at. The uh, one thing, well, I'll mention that when we get to the other meeting. Okay. Um, Halo also um, is underneath that. So on um, 31st of July, we, there was a meeting called in Tabor to talk about HALO and we could attend personally or by teleconference. And you know, I hadn't done a teleconference meeting for a while, so I decided that that's what I would do. And boy, it's just not the same. <laughs> 
especially when they go on for a long time and you're listening and uh, anyhow, it was a very it went from one till two forty. Um, the only items on the agenda were halo d discussion about funding and oil and gas. So Dale Thacker, the founder and co-chair of the Halo board, was there and talked about the history of Halo and the um, problems that they have had with with funding. And long story short, they are in, in desperate need of funding, but the municipalities really don't have the capacity to fund them to the degree that they need funding. The fellow that um, is very involved with them, um, oh, what's his name, Les, somebody. Anyhow, the, the people that have been involved with them have been very dedicated, as we know, Les Little. He's one of the original people, and uh, he has been um, striving very hard to keep, keep it going to the point of um, taking on quite a bit of debt, and apparently now he's selling his motor, <laughs> motor home. Like, this is a dedicated to Halo fellow. And I basic, basically got out of this meeting that Halo is a Chevy system versus a Cadillac system that STARS operates, but it's, it's a lean and mean and very appropriate for the job that is required. So Grant Hunter was involved in this meeting and he, um, they're, they're trying to continue to lobby the government. All the government has said, the minister has said that once the budget is in place, or once they have their budget discussions, they'll know more. So all that came out of this long visit uh, was that the Southeast and Southwest will each put together letters to send to the minister expressing their support for HALO and their disappointment with the government for their lack of support for HALO. So that was uh, long and short of, that was quite a lengthy meeting. Um, the other thing that came out of the oil and gas is that, interestingly enough, and I tried to find on the, the two websites when their taxes are due, but the county of Vulcan, or Vulcan County and Cypress County, have um, some oil and gas companies that are deciding on their own that they're only going to pay 65% of their taxes, rather than the whole amount. And so, this was something that uh, was pointed out when we met with the Minister of Municipal Affairs when they made this decision to adjust the shallow gas power uh, or ga shallow and gas um, wells and pipelines that perhaps it would cause some other things to happen unknowingly. And I think this is a good example of something that is a fallout from this decision. So, um, a number a number of companies anyhow have apparently uh, felt as so that they can just say, well, we're just, this is what we're paying. So, where that will go, we're not, uh, we're not sure. The other thing that there was a motion passed at the meeting as well, and getting back to HALO was to uh, request an independent review by the Minister of Health in regards to air ambulance services in Alberta, which I think would make good sense. So we'll see if that gets uh, any feet with the government. So that was just some information that I wanted you to know about that meeting because we don't meet again for a while. So. Any questions? Wayne. Have, have you thought about taking a resolution to RMA about the, the, the review of air ambulance in a province? Because it, it does affect just rural Alberta. And also, uh, HALO was involved in a 
very serious accident up by Owen a couple of days ago. So again, that service is invaluable. It, it is, and I'm thinking that it would have to be probably an emergent resolution because one hasn't been put in that I'm aware of for for uh, Foothills Little Bow. I don't I don't know. There was no mention of that. I know that Halo has been on the agenda. I think before with resolutions, perhaps, but I'm not I'm not positive, Wayne. Maybe we could get the chair of Foothills Little Bow to look into that, eh? Now, now, now that I remember who the chair is, <laughs> Anne Marie, I think it's a good thing to do that independent report, and then act, then we hopefully will know whether we need two or one, and we can make our decisions accordingly. And as far as a rural service, Wayne, I couldn't help but thinking everybody uses all yeah. the roads all the time, so I think it's for everyone. It might be more significant to rural people, but it doesn't mean that it's not important to all. You're right. I, I didn't think about, but there's hospital services like somebody in Medicine Hat or something like has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So Haley would be in that position. So yeah. yeah, you're right. But I think it's a good idea to ask the government to to do that and and. Um, Perhaps we'll leave it with uh, the southeast and southwest chairs. That's Gordon Reynolds from Bow Island and Lauren Hickey still from County of Lethbridge to deal with. So, all right, and I see that uh, we have Cole here. So Cole, join us at the table. We'll move back to item 11.1, the NRSC report, welcome. Thank you, Reeve Douglas and councillors. Uh, I submitted my report for everybody to see, so if you have a copy of it, you can see that it's pretty lean, um, which is a good thing. Don't have too much going on outside the ordinary day-to-day -day operations, so that's good. Um, just like to touch on the Hamlet distribution systems first. Uh, Cummins, again, um, will be out to do the quinquennial servicing on the county's backup generators. So this uh, incorporates some of the preventative maintenance that they only do once every five years. So that's ongoing as we speak. Uh, Lake New Resort had theirs done this week and then the others will follow shortly. Uh, rural water, um, the county water project, everything's normal there, nothing outside of the ordinary. Wastewater collection, I spoke to you last um, report that we had removed one of the pumps at Lake Mill Resort. Um, got word back on it's nothing catastrophic, so they're going to redo some electrical components at the top end and put a new guide on it, and then it should be back in service in the next couple weeks, um, which is good news. They didn't have to rebuild the pump itself, so that's good. Rolling Hills Lagoon, the discharge was completed this week. The landowner, uh, uh, Kelly Shackleton, uh, discharged that via the irrigation pivot, so that's complete for the year. Uh, Alberta Environment Park and Parks has been uh, coming around and doing inspections on county-owned uh, water systems, so we've had five inspections since my last report, and they all went really well, so. Um, I don't have the exact reports yet back from them, but there's no issues noted and we did really well on those, so. And that's the extent of my report. Any questions for Cole? Wayne. Um, uh, Cole, on this uh, lagoon discharge, that goes through the pivot onto what kind of crop has he got there? I'm not too sure. I can answer that question. It's on Timothy. I don't know what he's using it for, but I know he's growing Timothy. I had never heard of the word quinquennial. That's great, Cole. I'm, I can't even take full credit for that. That was in an email that they gave me, so I just stole it from them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Did they put five years? And, and yeah. <laughs> That's great. Anything else for Cole? 
Just a comment while Cole is here, it reminds me that yesterday a number of us attended the funeral for Ralph Havinga in Medicine Hat. And if you thought he was an interesting fellow who worked for us, we found out he was even more interesting. Uh, I think we most of us knew that he was a singer and a songwriter, but I went and looked at the display they had. He was also an actor. Interesting, interesting character. Built a lot of stuff as, as well from the sounds of things. So it was a very um, nice funeral. And Clarence, our NRSC chair, participated in the funeral and did a great job, of course. It was, uh, it was just, just good and... and um, Highlight of <laughs> highlight for me was Peter Brower was there. Remember Peter Brower, and uh, he was involved in our MP first MPE stuff, engineering from Lethbridge, and then uh, he retired to Salt Spring Island and became a long-haired hippie, and which was just so odd. And his hair wasn't that long, and he did have a suit on yesterday on a very hot day <laughs> in Southern Alberta. <laughs> But he and Miles and Andrew from MPE plus other people were there, which I thought the fact that Peter had come back for that said a lot about um, his relationship with Ralph. And he said, I think it was to Kevin and to me when we visited with him, that Ralph was always fair with them. He said, and lots, sometimes people aren't fair with, you know, in their dealings, but he said, He's very fair, and he had so he had huge respect for for him for that. So Cole was there too, obviously. Nothing else. Thanks, Cole. Come in. Enjoy the rest of the fast flying summer. Yeah. All right. We don't have a lot. Um, <laughs> Is, is Mark coming in today, Lane, for his report? Or we, we can, we'll just carry on, of course. But till, if he comes, then he'll have it done before lunch, if he's available. Um, otherwise, we have nothing until 11.30 uh, till page 3, I think. Our final page, uh, we've done the post uh, agenda items and information items. We had a regionalization meeting just yesterday. Uh, I'll say a few things about that and then let, let uh, Kevin or Kevin or Clarence also speak to it, just continuing to work on our information, development of our information, and the, the communications group that was hired to work with us out of, uh, from ISL Engineering in Calgary, of course that's part of the grant money that was received from the provincial government. Mm. They were hired and they yesterday presented a whole package of information on, on their communication strategy. And it is interesting, I've never been involved with uh, communications in a formal manner like this. And it's, it's interesting that the things that they, they look at and uh, um, the approaches that they take to get the message out. So, for example, the um, some of their major head headings in this document is to acknowledge the concerns of residents, and I think we've been trying hard to do that in a fair and um, objective manner and open um, to enhance understanding and to share the process that we're, that we're working through this process. And obviously there's pros and cons to, from a, 
the municipalities involved are looking at increasing employee communications within their uh, own um, businesses about it and to encourage participation of all of our residents is part of their tactics and, and uh, strategy. So that was, uh, that was interesting, at least I found it interesting. And um, uh, Clarence, I don't know if you wanted to mention anything. It's pretty much carrying on as we, the, the agenda basically of our meeting stays the same, it's just that, that we continue to, to work on flushing out items and sort of coming to conclusions about some things, so. No? Or Kevin? So Madam Reeve, the, the one item that um, we're still waiting to hear back from is the City of Brooks on the governance model of 5, 5, and 1. Um, the committee had agreed um, yesterday that um, the proposal for having the um, mayor or Reeve uh, selected internally was going to be taken to the City of Brooks meeting on the 19th, I think they said, of August for uh, consideration. So, um, But anyway, the committee has recommended the model that the county uh, and Bassano had put forward. So um, taxation-wise, um, the group had indicated that um, they don't want to see any increases to any of the ratepayers in terms of their mill rates and uh, they will be looking at possible reductions depending on uh, how the budget discussions and that work comes through between the two finance departments. Amory? The last media release that you forwarded to us uh, was a couple of days ago. Um, it looked different than what we usually got and so I wondered if ISL already did that one and whether they did or not. I really liked the way it was laid out, step by step, and how you started um, a year ago and where you are now, and it really clearly identifies the work that has been done. So that was, that was a good job. Well, that's good, good feedback. Um, continue to let people know that all this information is at regionalwg.ca. Um, I tell people who call me to go there if they want uh, information that is in fact based on what we're looking at. Facts and statistics and accurate. Anything else? All right, Mark, thank you for coming in. Not a problem. Good morning, everyone. We'll go back to item 11-2. Uh, so uh, update for the last uh, month's worth of work in municipal services. Greater operators have been busy tending to gravel road surfaces, which is typical of time of year. Uh, some rain events offered relief uh, from the extremely dry conditions and whatnot, so operators worked some additional overtime to get uh, roads shaped up and take advantage of that moisture in the roads and, and try to get things tightened up so that the washboard wasn't uh, as relevant anymore. They've completed approximately 4,380.6 kilometers of road surface maintenance this year so far, uh, which is approximately three rotations. So uh, if council remembers, just on a basis that it takes about one, one, uh, one rotation is about 20 days in each respective greater maintenance area. So, um, Truck drivers, gravel road resurfacing, they, they are absolutely flat out with that. Uh, they're working in the greater maintenance area number two right now, which is Tilly. They've also been working in the Tilly area with some of the uh, road shoulder pull projects to get the initial uh, aggregate down on that. And um, they're making some good headway there. So the, the summary tells you how much is complete in, in the various areas. And uh, just for council uh, information, a reminder, I guess, Greater maintenance area is still, uh, area one is still based around Rolling Hills primarily. Two, based around Tilly. 
three, uh, primarily Patricia, but it does creep south down to um, the top end of Division 10 a little bit in there with the Charles subdivision and whatnot. Division 4, Scandia Rainier Bull City. Division or Greater Maintenance Area number 5 is actually Brooks, so Electoral Division 5 and 10 is how we look at that with the greater areas. Uh, 6 remains consistent with the Electoral Division for Bazano. Area 7 is Rosemary and Duchess area. That area was combined when we, re when we um, reduced the number of graders that we have on the road. And then Area 8 uh, takes care of primarily the gem area of things. Um, yeah, and keeping up with sign maintenance and whatnot, 31 work orders, four of them uh, related to brushing. Uh, sign work orders consisted of 20 posts, 25 sign replacements. We've done uh, one refuse in ditch cleanup and uh, three uh, related work orders to guardrail repairs and stuff. Other than that, they assisted in July and, and that late June period with the dust abatement program. Shoulder pull program, as I mentioned, taking uh, place in Tilly area. Contractors working on 17.5 and 13.2. Uh, approximately 50% complete the work with an anticipated completion of August 9th. So that's coming up here real quick. And then staff are also busy working on preliminary work uh, for shoulder pulls in 2020 in the Rolling Hills area. So there's lath and locates, verification of uh, pipeline depths and stuff like that for the shallow utilities and third party utility providers such as TELUS. Um, what are we doing? Terry, Terry managed to uh, achieve his asset management planning. So him and Roberta completed that. So that has uh, myself, Matt, Terry, Roberta and Todd all certified in the asset management program offered through the FCM. Um, I guess they've expanded that program to allow for upwards of seven employees per organization now to partake. So I don't know if that's because across Canada hasn't taken it up as much as what we have, or maybe we're just that much further ahead on the trend of things than, than others are. Rural water service network under the engineering component. Uh, Based on the registrations from when the program kicked off, there were 1,556 registered locations, making this a point of clarification due to information being circulated, but 1,556 registered locations to receive water, 1,171, so 1,171 are actively receiving water. That is the 75%. There have been figures out there of there are 2,600 residences in the county of Newell. How does the county come up with 75% active? Not all 2,600 residential points have water. They did not register for it, nor have they come to us. We've had a few, I guess, after the fact come to us to take it on on themselves, but there were 1,556 registered, 1,171 active, meaning there's 385 that are inactive. So 1,556 people paid their $1,000 to participate, Correct. basically. And 1,171 of them have hooked up. Correct. Which makes 75%. All of them have a curb stop in front of their place, but not all of them have their flow emitter and actively drawing water. And as you mentioned, we pick up a few most months that have hooked up. Yep, past month, two new activations, but you know what? Two new activations out of... 1,556 doesn't change the percentage marker very much, so we, we need to see like 10 new activations per month to see that percentage change. So that's why we've been stuck there for such a long period. And we have to remember some of these locations that people registered for have a service, but there's not necessarily a house sitting there either. They, they did it based on speculation and they haven't proceeded with any development or anything at this time. Um, I can't speak on everybody's behalf because we've had this conversation around council table often that why have people not connected? I don't know their financial situation. I don't know what their cistern looks like. I don't know what their future plans for their, for their home is, if they're planning on building or replacing or whatever, but they haven't proceeded. There's 385 of them. So, And some of those paid 7,000. Yes. Yes. That's important to note if they yeah. were of the speculating group. Right. 
Um, so further on with that Highway 876 paving project, uh, most third party utilities have relocated for us, which is excellent. TELUS, Dinosaur Gas, Altalink have all completed their relocating. Uh, Fortis, Alberta continues to work because they were the major uh, affected third party. Uh, they are working on north and south portions of that roadway to relocate their uh, overhead power lines. Trans-Canada Pipelines also has yet to relocate a, a pipeline crossing. And the subcontractor to AECON Group Inc. Uh, to perform the dirt work is preparing to commence work and uh, will well, will work well into the October period to get as much done as they can this year, which we're anticipating will be all of it. So hopefully they do get it all and, and we have a nice fall for them. Partnership on drainage uh, completed south of Rainier and they're working on uh, north Rainier now. And uh, Bow City area for 2020 has been surveyed and that design is in progress and I'm working uh, with the EID staff on that. Uh, what else we got here? Highlight municipal address contest. I don't know if this is a highlight or a low light. Uh, it was a contest that we attempted to put out there to help educate ratepayers on knowing their address for the purposes of emergency services as well as getting their friends and family to their door. Um, a possible 2,540 eligible entries. That includes a few in industrial sites. So there are some oil and gas um, facilities out there that have rural addresses on them. I did not omit them from this because they too were capable of submitting an entry. Uh, 46 entries were received over about a month long advertising period for the contest. So 1.8% of eligible entries were received and those people just had the better odds of winning the, the 200 bucks towards uh, their taxes or utilities. So it's good to take it up. It was good to put it out there. Um, sad to see that there was such low participation in it, but you know what? Maybe there's some people that saw it out there and they learned a little bit from it, but they just chose not to enter the contest. So that's what we can hope for in a way. Municipal enforcement keeps up with their things. Um, 40 warnings issued over the past period, 14 tickets and 60 investigations um, throughout the region on things. And uh, they were called in to assist with traffic control and, and such for the motor vehicle versus train collision just south and east of the aqueduct crossing that took place. And uh, they've been uh, working with uh, our partners with their hourly commitments and whatnot. Electronic speed signs in replace, are in place in Rolling Hills and Scandia. Uh, we also purchased that electronic uh, trailered message board uh, for construction projects and stuff. It too has a radar in it, so we put it to work in Castles after there were some uh, ratepayer concerns of the speed of some people driving through Castles area. Uh, the, the road from Highway 36 to Castles is actually 80 kilometers an hour and through the hamlet of Castles is 50. Uh, some people are very much in excess of 50 kilometers an hour through there. And last but not least, the permit activity report. Uh, we talked about this a, bit, a little bit at pre-budget meeting and stuff last week, but uh, the numbers are up there. We've, we've got 11% uh, percent change from the prior year on where our permits are forecasted to end. And uh, I just circled here myself to what the numbers of the current year are comparable to. And really you're looking at the year of 2017 and all the way back to 2014, we are quite comparable to those numbers for, for the overweight over dimensional moves. So we're doing not too bad in the region. Thanks, Mark. Questions for Mark? Lionel, Ryan? Um, First of all, just want to comment on our new paving project last year. I took, last night I took the liberty of, of using it. I did the 873 to the 535 and on to the 873 to Rainier from, came from Medicine Hat. And it worked so well. I just, <laughs> it's the first time I'd made that connection. It was perfect. But um, I have a question about the water. So I had a, a call from a resident who inquired at the county about getting water hook up. And they were, they were not sure about their numbers, but they talked about an $18,000 
costs, which I, I can't disagree with, but they were quite concerned about that. They're in um, Johnson's Estates, so that they're quite close to the line, but it's also very inconvenient to hook onto that existing line now. So just wondered if you could comment on that a little. Um, I, I didn't even know, well, I, I told them to go check with an independent contractor and see what the cost would be for them. I'm assuming that this is somebody that is not registered. That's correct. They were going to sell their place, so they didn't register for the water. And now they're selling it <laughs> and find out they need the water. Okay, so the interesting thing about an $18,000 comment is $7,000 of that is for the registration and $700 more is for the future water license. So that's the $7,700 that we now charge. So you're left with virtually $10,000 out of that and to dig up the road to dig it up inside the property line, install the curb stop and stuff, it could be a very realistic number. And uh, furthermore to that comment, I've heard through the realtor grapevine that's, that places that have connected to the rural water system are valued anywhere between twenty to $50,000 more than places that are not. So it's, people just didn't um, grasp the, um, the benefit, I guess, because when we had it offered for $1,000, I thought that was basically a give me, but as council realized, that wasn't a given either, so. The comment they made was that that $18,000 number came from the county office. And is that correct or is that? Yeah, so, so Jeff, he, he will, well, the 77 will be in there in the first place and then he calls contractors to find out what their, their estimated cost based on the distance and the situation is. So that's, that's how he produces that individual quote each and every time. And I think he's actually got it down to now that there, um, we can punch in a, a linear meter distance and based on the history of the costs um, per, per location that have been done, um, it just generates it for us to put us in the ballpark. Brian? Um, my question is in regards to the EID drainage pro partnership program. And um, I remember the first year that we were in it, we had one issue with a landowner not wanting to um, sell land. And I'm just curious how that process has been since, whether you've had to um, adjust adjust um, values for land as, as time has gone on and um, whether you've run into any hurdles as far as acquiring that land for right away working space, etc. Land compensation is uh, something that's based off of a number derived by the EID and um, it has changed since the inception of the program and stuff. Um, I we still have landowners out there that um, claim that their land is worth more. Sometimes I would say that it's potentially worth more, but we're not aiming for a market value on each, every individual parcel of land out there. We are looking to treat all landowners on the same project the same way at the same consistent measure, because otherwise people are going to hold out to the end and try to hold your ransom and look for 10 times what you paid the first guy that signed up on the program. And chances are the guy that signed up first on the program is the one that realizes the benefit of the program, doesn't necessarily need the compensation, but sees the value in getting the water away. Whereas the last guy maybe doesn't have any benefit or any desire, but he wants to ask for more just because they, they can. We, we end up in that situation all the time still, where there is somebody that is in between, somebody that's gonna benefit and where the water needs to get to that doesn't wanna participate in it and we just cancel it off the program, unfortunately. I actually appreciate that. I, I'm glad to hear that that's the logic because I think this is um, 
such a beneficial program to our area and to put to hold somebody at ransom is inappropriate i'm just i was just my my question is more in regards to have you had significant pushback when it comes to the projects we've done or has there been a great deal of buy-in when it comes to uh, property owners that realize the benefits of in the end yeah I, I think i think for the better part the majority of people understand it still um i do believe at the same time though that sometimes short-term memory kicks in and they forgot that what all got flooded out when it got flooded out last and and it's not an issue right now but when it's an issue we'll hear about it again and unfortunately we're not coming back because we have other things that we want to get through on the program before we consider coming back through anything that's like 20 bucks isn't it were there other questions Wayne. First of all, I took a look last night at that uh, grader pad in Rainier. Looks real good. It's uh, better than what it was. So, another thing is, who was bringing up this controversy about the the water systems? Uh, like, twenty six hundred residences that possibly get water, and that sounds like somebody was trying to turn the numbers around for their purpose. Do you want me to answer that? It, I, I think I can just... It, it started... Um, it was a question to us in one of these ads, July 16th, the Brooks Bulletin. County staff and councillors are stating that 75% of the 2,627 county residences or dwellings are hooked to the 50 plus million dollar regional water. We think this is false and could they prove those numbers so this is one way of getting it on the public record and mark has been giving us these updates all all the way along wayne so that's that's why anything else clarence so do we have a number of total residences in the county active I don't have that number right now the number that I have is that there are 2540 civic address points under the bylaw for civic addressing um, it includes a component where if industry wanted to request a facility that is typically occupied by one of their employees to have an address we could address it for them so we're not talking about a well site. We are talking about a building structure that they frequent. Potentially there's an office in it that emergency services might need to come to. So rather than trying to use the LSD or legal land description or, or range road or township road or something to describe where the emergency is, they have a physical residential address. No different than we can say how many residences are out there but that's not true either because the system also serves commercial and industrial buildings in our industrial parks and 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 such so i i don't have that number offhand no but there were i was trying to figure out what that number was originally when we planned the rural water system but there's been houses built since as well right but i do believe it was over that 2000 mark Clarence, I think it might, there's stuff under Stats Canada for the county of Newell. Well, I, I was just wondering, because I mean, I think I asked you this once before, do you also know how many were taken down? I mean, we had, or even for ourselves, I mean, we had five different addresses for our farm and there's only one now. Um, so I, I just wondered if we have any, if we don't keep that track of that. No, I don't have anything on that. And right now the county doesn't require demolition permits on buildings either, which would be the way to determine whether houses were removed or not. But res civic addressing points, um, some of those have remained in place because the landowners wanted to keep them in place when they've, when they've removed a home. Uh, for the better part though, uh, most of them want them pulled because they don't mean anything to them anymore either. 
So the number that we have is 3,069 dwelling units in the county. That's what we report to uh, municipal affairs. And that was at the end of 2017, but that includes hamlets and, and dwelling units entirety. So that it's not gonna be particularly ones that are tied directly to the, the system. So Mark's number is the only one that we have for applications and who's connected. Anything else? Thanks, Mark. We need a motion to accept the municipal reports. Somebody would like to make that. Kelly will move. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Um, Diane, we did the... Uh, planning and development report. And so we're just finishing off the agenda until 1130, so you know. So we'll go back to, and is that everything for you that's on there, the? Yeah. No, we could do those, right? because that's not part of the public hearing. 8-3, item 8-3, Diane, do you want to help us through that one? Oh, okay. Well, we can, we can carry on and wait till 11.30 if that works better for you. Okay, carry on. All right, going back to, will we be at item 13-1-1? <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. The Division 4 meeting in Rainier. Wayne, that was your meeting. Any comments? Well, uh, it was well attended. There was quite a few people there. And, uh, yeah, we were, uh, Kevin and I were questioned quite a bit. I don't think we changed any minds in that room. I heard from my, from people all over the county, because it wasn't just Division 4, and uh, I heard what they said, and that's about all I can comment on. I tried to convince them that we were in the middle of a process, and at the end of it, we will have something to present them. But the majority, of, I think, on there wanted to shut it down right now, and that's what I heard. And they weren't, they weren't willing to let the, to, to look forward and see if there was anything else besides what they wanted. Uh, all I can say is I, we, I sat there and listened to them. Uh, I think maybe some of the comments towards Kevin was uh, a little too personal. No, well. Uh, and I, I apologize to Kevin for that, because although it wasn't our meeting, I, that wasn't called for, but it, that's the way it happened. So there we go. Well, I'm sorry to hear that part of it, because I would hope our residents would uh, not behave like that. This isn't about people, this is about policies and well, processes. They, they brought up the fact that, well, uh, that they thought there was a conflict of interest and, and I, it's, Ke Kevin, uh, he's been giving us good advice all the time and he's always tried to stay neutral on subjects, as we all know that. And this, I'm, I am, Disappointed that this was brought up this way, but uh, that's the way things go, I guess. So, and All we'll right. see what the future brings. Thanks, Wayne. Any other comments from? Okay, um, Division Two meeting date there. Item thirteen one point three 
is a letter to the Premier from Div 10 residents. I think it's really important that we respond to all letters we receive. This one is a CC, it's a letter to the Premier that was CC'd to us, so um, I don't know what you would like done with the CC type letters, Council, if you have any. It, we received a copy of it, a CC copy. So as you know, we always like to respond to letters that come to us, or we have in the past. So I just brought this one here too, to see what you would like done with it. We can, Kelly. My thoughts are that um, it was sent to us for our information, that um, we just treat it as information. Certainly can. Any other, any other thoughts? All right, uh, Amory. I I agree with Kelly because there are some um, statements in this letter that are not correct, but it's part of our research uh, that we're doing right now. So in September, October, when we have our open houses, then hopefully people are open to the right information. So to spend too much time correcting this letter at this time maybe doesn't make any sense yet. And it is the letter to the Premier rather than us, so I think we'll probably um, handle it that way then, accept it for information. Um, do we have any in-camera items today? No? Okay. So after we get our hearing done, I think that is it for our meeting, right? No? Is there other stuff? Just our public hearings and uh, our most, our bylaws. And so we will go to 8.3 now because we're still not right at the 11.30 mark. So bylaw 1915-19 is a road closure and lease. And if you can find that on your agendas. Okay, so this is um, for second and third reading of this road closure. Um, it is uh, Sundial Feeders, so approximately 11 kilometers southeast of Bizano. Um, those lands um, are currently being irrigated by the pivots that you can see. And so just to allow for him to continue his farming operation. We want to close and lease those road allowances to the landowner. Um, so it's recommended that we, or that council, sorry, provide second and third reading for this bylaw. Any questions? Kelly? Uh, motion uh, to approve second reading. Okay. Always moving second reading. Wayne. Um, don't we have to go through public, uh, public hearing before we not do this stuff? I'm, I'm just saying I, I don't want somebody coming and saying we did this wrong. <laughs> you know what, I, you, I hope yeah. you understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. So maybe we just wait a few minutes and then get the public hearing done. No, th this one's post. Is it already done? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm... we're at second and third reading. Okay. Oh, right. It's come back from Alberta Transportation. Yeah, slap they, me. Yeah, they, we had Alberta Transportation uh, approval the middle of June, or July, pardon me. No problem, Wayne. Good you're on your toes. <laughs> um, all right, Kelly has moved it. All in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. And for third reading, Wayne would like to move that. Good job, Wayne. All in favor, opposed, motion is carried. So that gets 
8.3 off our agenda. And <laughs> this has never happened before where, where we are ahead of, have everything accomplished. And I guess we really do have to wait, right? Because someone could, someone could come in. So I'm afraid to let you loose, so because it'll be it'll be 1:30 then. So you must stay within this room. <laughs> so, but you certainly can grab a coffee or something, and we'll uh, we'll reconvene at 11:30 for public hearing.
All right, it's uh, past 11.30, so we'll accept uh, reconvene our council meeting, and we need a motion to move into public hearings. Uh, Ellen beat you to it. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Motion is carried. And this is for bylaw 1954-19, and we'll hand it back to Diane to tell us about it. Great, thank you very much. So again, just to remind everyone, this particular bylaw is to redesignate an approximate 6.6 .6 acre parcel from acreage residential um, to single lot agricultural, which is SLA, in order to accommodate um, the approval of a greenhouse operation um, that is currently on site. So again, uh, the parcel was zoned back in 2007 um, as a multi-lot subdivision um, based on its location next to the highway. Um, we've got a situation where we've got one large parcel um, that again, this um, applicant and landowner wishes to um, use for a different purpose. So again, um, it is adjacent to 542. So comments from Alberta Transportation are, are important in this one. So we did um, notify all adjacent landowners um, as well as referral agencies and uh, put our advertisement in the newspaper. Um, we have received responses from the circulation from Alberta Environment and Parks, the Public Lands Department, and they have no concerns. Alberta Transportation um, indicated that it could be accommodated. Um, no new accesses to um, the 542 would be allowed. And again, a roadside development permit um, when that um, is required will be required for any development on site. And municipal services indicated no comments on this particular one. We did not receive anything from any adjacent landowners. So I'm happy to answer any questions council might have on this one. Are there any questions? Brian. Um, drainage and runoff, how is it handled with this parcel? And again, we don't have a um, drainage plan as part of the uh, rezoning application. But again, we do have, if you know the, the land at all, it is kind of a bench right along um, the 542. Um, then we have the canal, and then it kind of runs off down to the, the CP. Um, a lot of the lands that are on the residual parcel have shown up on the wetland um, layer as uh, wetlands and, and all types of things. So again, I think drainage uh, tends to go that direction or again, it would flow to the highway and into the ditch. So again, as development occurred, anything more than, than agriculture, um, if we were going to be covering the um, site with uh, structures and buildings and those types of things as development moves forward, um, that may very well be something that needs to be considered as a drainage plan as to how to hold it on site. Other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next public hearing, 1955-19. Diane? Great, thank you very much. Again, this is um, a portion of the southwest of 15 20, 17, west of the 4th. We're looking to rezone approximately 29.24 acres um, from the agricultural district to small holdings. Um, to accommodate the future subdivision of a parcel at that location. Um, again, as we know in our agricultural district, we only allow two kinds of subdivisions, um, a vacant parcel to the um, size, maximum size of seven acres and a um, farmstead to the extent of the development. Um, in this case, we have a, a house and um, this is beyond the um, extent of the uh, yard site and the only um, zone that would accommodate a subdivision of this size is a small holding zone. So again, um, that's before council for its consideration. Uh, we again did the same um, process where we circulated to adjacent landowners, to uh, referral agencies, um, as well as posting it in the newspaper and on, online. And we received one comment from municipal services with, that had no comment. So I'm happy to answer questions on this one. And are there any questions? Ellen. Now, if there's no comment from uh, municipal services, does that mean they have not reviewed it? I would suggest because they gave us a comment, they've reviewed it and have no comments. If we got nothing, we would probably have zero comments from them. Anne-Marie, Brian, um, how is the irrigation on that parcel? This particular one um, is just a pasture at this point. There is no pivot or anything on it. Um, again, it is um, most of these are part of the irrigation district, so there's probably some potential for it, but at this point, it is just pasture. 
So this, um, what, what is the logic for the configuration of the parcel beyond the yard site? The applicant have indicated that they would like the additional pasture for horses and, and a, a larger um, residential parcel is, is the um, information I've received on it. So, and as an additional question, what is the additional acreage beyond the actual farm site? You're asking very tough questions. I don't have that particular piece. Um, perhaps if we can bring up the uh, GIS on this particular property, it'll give you an idea. Um, Because I don't think the air photo was included in your package. That one wasn't. So the, yeah, that would have been a, a helpful piece. Okay. Yeah. So I need the southwest of fifteen twenty seven. In the drawing, um, again, it's kind of a linear parcel. We have a dugout at the south end, um, a house, and then some buildings kind of halfway up where they're proposing. Um, and then as you can see, there was a pipeline right away that kind of went. So anything sort of north of that is vacant. So um, hopefully when we bring this up, you can take a quick peek at it. I would suggest probably um, from it is, I'd almost say 10 acres is probably the additional lands. We would probably allow them um, the, the 20 acre parcel based on where the um, improvements are right now. Fifteen twenty seven. Correct. So as you can see on the south end, there's a dugout, um, a tree row, some miscellaneous buildings. Um, it does appear that it goes um, significantly, because again, the, the, the parcel is 613 meters long. So we're looking at almost uh, the entire um, western portion of that quarter section. Not overly wide, just about 200 meters, but um, definitely longer. Yeah, I don't know if you can use that thing or not. So I, I don't have this specific number, but um, there's definitely what I would consider additional pasture land included in this parcel that um, I would, when discussing it with them, indicated if they wanted a 30-acre parcel with that additional land, it wouldn't meet the requirements of the land use bylaw. Brian, did you, you're good? Well, the question, um, I think, I think you're, well, I can't, I have to ask a question, so, and I have asked my question, so Diane has answered it to the best of her ability. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, we need a motion to move out of public hearing now. Hubie moves us out. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Which takes us to the first bylaw, item 8-1. From acreage residential to single lot agricultural. Tracy, Tracy will. I'll make the motion. It's second reading, right? Yeah. 
Second reading for that bylaw. Questions? All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And for third reading, Lionel moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. And for item 8-2, bylaw 1955-19, Ag to small holdings, second and third reading for second reading. Ellen moves, second reading. Questions? Brian. Well, my, my comment re revolves around the question in public hearing. I, I think this is one of those cases where we're going beyond what is necessary for the, for the parcel. Um, the, the yard site. I'm fully in support of subdividing the yard site. I just have an issue with taking the extra land and putting it into small holdings. So I'll be voting against this motion. Ellen? May I ask why? Because we do have it in a land use bylaw up to 40 acres. Just curious why. This is, a, this is going to be a subdivision. It's not agriculture, small holdings. So. But there's always a possibility to do something with the land, correct? This time it's horses, perhaps people want to turn it into a horticultural, short, short, small horticultural center. So I can see there's uses for that. Any other questions? All right, um, all in favor of second reading? Opposed? Motion is carried. Four versus six, I believe. And for third reading, Clarence moves third reading. All in favor? Six. Again, motion is carried. Anything else today? from the agenda. Otherwise, we will adjourn at 11.45. That is a record. It is. 11.45.